Hi, this is Sinead Coughlin and Lorraine Finn, and we are the Senior Speech and Language Therapists from the Down Syndrome Center. Today, we are going to be talking about visual supports and what is AAC. So I will be speaking about visual supports and Lorraine will go over what exactly is AAC, because I'm sure you might see or read it about it or hear therapists talking about it. So here we go. What are visual supports? So they can be anything from pictures, words, images, um, but what they're truly doing is making auditory information, information visual so that instructions are clarified for the student um, with a visual and therefore increases comprehension. So it's just very helpful to support the learning for children. And um, it also is helpful for us to remember things um, when we can see it. So when we present information verbally, the words are available for just a brief moment. When we present it visually, it can be there for as long as the student needs it. So who uses visual supports? Well, we actually all use them. So we make lists, um, shopping lists, we write things on calendars, we have diaries, we have phones, um, we read road signs, street signs, follow directions. We never grow out of using visual supports. The supports may grow and change with us. However, we still always use them. And now you might find when you're at home, it's good giving your children a list of to-do activities um, before they might get their rewards at the end of the day. So when we're talking about people with Down syndrome, um, we've learned a lot over the years that visual learning is a strength for children with Down syndrome. And the aim of vis visual supports is to support communication. Um, it's never replacing it, it's just helpful um, with that comprehension and reinforcing the message. And visual supports help us to communicate, share, manage expectations, rules, provide reminders, teach new skills, increase independence, and support appropriate behavior. And what we found over the years is it really helps to reduce anxiety when children are prepared for what's going to happen in their day, in their week, be it a routine um, events, or especially when it's something new, like the situation we're in at the moment. So here's something um, that was written by an unknown known author and it describes how it feels when visual supports are used and it may help us to understand what children with down syndrome may sometimes feel when i see i understand when i hear i forget in one ear and out the next but it makes more sense to me when there's something i can see whether i'm young or old it helps to see what I am told. A written word, a picture card can simplify what might be hard. A visual aid describes it best and gives the voice and ears a rest. From making friends to handling fear, showing me how makes it more clear. There's not much left to explain when a picture shows my brain. Who or where or what you mean on a clear computer screen. To recall what you heard, a picture paints a thousand words. So that's a very nice um, way to kind of understand how helpful visuals are for children with Down syndrome. And I think like that, any child who's learning, um, providing multi-modalities, visual, tactile, and auditory is all just really helping reinforce the message and helping it stick. So some visuals that we've used um, in sessions or you might see your children use in school or maybe even at home is choice boards. And those are uh, made up of things that your child might like to do a lot. So they're able to pick it out. Um, it gives them a lot of independence and um, a sense of self and choice. Um, it also helps us understand what they want or what they'd like to do. 
So you can put food on it and stick it up on your fridge or on the press, or you put places near the door or books, activities, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes you only need one or two. Um, sometimes they can have four or eight. It all depends um, on what you think is going to best help them. Too much choice though is not always helpful. There's also first and then boards. These are quite popular in school as well. Um, so especially if you wanna get through a task they don't really like, the next task can be something they really do enjoy um, or you just prepare them for the steps they're going to have coming up. So brush your teeth, then go to bed, read a story, bed, etc. homework, then you get your movie, um, all of those kind of things. So they're just good to spell it out um, and shows the child what expectations are needed. Visual schedules are very popular. Um, it helps to transition from one activity to the end. It shows beginning, end, the sense of time. It helps children to know something is going to come to an end and they will move on. Um, some children are able to have the whole day, the whole week. Some children just need the activity broken down and that's enough for them. And um, it's um, also nice to mix it with something preferred and something maybe not so preferred. And um, it's also good when you're trying to teach new skills like toileting or dressing or brushing your teeth independently. So um, it reminds us that there's lots of steps involved if we take the time to break it down visually. Independent living skills. So when you're trying to give your children more independence like doing the shopping with you. They could have their own shopping list with them and they can go around the supermarket and find the things um, alongside. Um, using a picture schedule to show steps involved when taking a shower, making a sandwich, any of those things are all great ways to just build independence and then giving a nice sense of uh, self and confidence. Um, so that, that's another idea there. And one we use often in our group sessions is this news board. So this is trying to support narratives, which can be kind of a difficult language task for children. Um, so this organizes it and provides the, what did you do, the who, where did you go, when, and how did you feel? So the child can um, break down all the steps and remember to include the relevant information for the story. So. This is good for when you read stories, go places, uh, do show and tell type activities. And now um, Lorraine is going to go over total communication and what AAC is. Thanks Sinead. I'm going to start with um, talking about the total communication methods, which is something probably most of you are doing with your children. This means using any means and every means to communicate and or receive a message. So we can use speech, pictures, gestures, um, high tech devices, um, love, pets to communicate. So creating a system that is that best fits an individual to communicate, optimizing his or her skills and reducing his or her impairments. That's what we want to do when we use a total communication approach. So there's many things that are communication systems. So th this can be such as use objects of reference systems. We can use environmental cues, like an exit sign is one of those. Our body language, our facial expression. We can use sign like love, pictures, pets, print. So it would be an um, alphabet chart, um, AAC, high and low tech. We'll be talking about that in a minute. Eye scanning in the form of an e-trad. We can use speech, voice and language. So it means that there isn't one modality that is best. But the best approach is to use a combination um, of approaches. So whether that's combining love and speech and language or pictures and speech and language, um, whichever works best for the child. Okay, so what is AAC? Augmentative and alternative communication is methods of communication that can be used to support or replace the more usual methods of speech and writing. So that can be anything that we can use 
to support our speech and language or use instead of our speech and language. So there are two main types of AAC. There's unaided, so we have body language, gesture, pointing, eye pointing, facial expression, vocalizations, and sign language. And we've aided, which comes in low tech and high tech. So low tech, so that's anything that you do not need a battery to function. So pen and paper, we can have an alphabet chart, we see here. You can have a symbols chart with the pictures there. You can have communication books, and they're usually have lots of different categories and it can be color coded as well. And that's to help um, people who use them to find their vocabulary quicker. Um, photo albums and communication passports are low tech and e-trans and you can see it here. And that is a transparent frame that has symbols and letters that are used to communicate. High tech. Um, communication systems are devices requiring at least a battery to operate. But they can um, be charged up as well. So simple high tech can be something as simple as a switch and it's a single message device. And another single message device is um, a go talk or a point of board. There's toys and books that speak when touched and there's um, anything that can have preloaded spoken messages on it. So um, also then on um, high tech, we have specialized computers, which include voice outputs. So I have some examples here. So a specialized computer includes an iPad with a communication app on top. And here you have a Prolico to go um, example of software on that. Here is the grid pad and that has the grid tree software on it there. And then this is a picture of the Indie device, and that has um, some, I think it's grid software on that, and it also uses as um, Snap and Core first. Okay, so AAC in children with um, Down syndrome. So I had a little look at some of the research that has been done, and uh, one paper that I thought was particularly nice is called Augmentative and Alternative Communication in Children with Down Syndrome, a Systematic Review. So it was done for ASHA and it was May 2018. So they looked at research that has been done on children with Down Syndrome who use AAC, low tech and high tech. Um, they think that it is extremely important to use tools that help in the development of communication to provide better socialization. Um, and then one or two of the nice quotes from that paper was they had significant results for children with Down syndrome in terms of interaction with each other and other people, improving interpersonal relationships. And when they looked at um, research done on speech generation devices, it improved communication due to speech improvement, cognition and socialization. And actually that quote is representative of the research that has been done. A lot of the research on AAC is showing that it um, improves um, speech of the children who use AAC rather than um, have a negative effect. It, all ha it has a positive effect. So that's great to know. So when we were thinking of high tech devices, we can go for low cost applications and then there's high cost applications. So I thought we'd take a look at the low cost applications. So this is all about iPads and how they have been um, made into communication devices through the use of communication apps. So first we're going to look at um, the companies. So companies who are making the very um, expensive and high tech devices, they have now designed um, communication apps that can be used on iPads as well. So the first two in my list here are those. So we're going to look at Grid for iPad. It's still a bit dear here. So it's $349.99 to buy it outright for your um, iPad and then $9.99 per month. So it is a version of the Grid 3 soft software. 
And then um, down here, um, the Snap and Core first software can go on an iPad now. And actually, uh, the companies offer iPad bundles. So in that, you'd get your software, your iPad, and a speech case as well. Um, so there, that's a that can be when it's all added together, it still can be a little bit expensive, but it is uh, definitely cheaper than the um, high-tech devices that are on the market. So other communication apps for iPads that are very popular, we've got the Proloco 2 to go, and that's around $279.99. Um, it lets your child talk using symbols of text in a natural sounding um, text-to-speech, and you can customize it. And that's a very popular app. And there's an, a lot of children um, that I that I see in uh, work that have um, an iPad with uh, the software. So next um, app is called Touch Chat. That's 169.99, and um, that can go on an iPhone, an iPod Touch, an iPad. We've got Quick Talk, which is 27.99, and we've got I Communicate, which is 54.99. So, um. All of them are different. Their price um, usually reflects um, the quality, the quality of the pictures, um, you know, how well they work as an app, how sophisticated the app is. Um, it might reflect how much vocabulary that's in it, and how if you can customize it and so on and so forth. Um, but you need to go and talk to your speech and language therapist about different apps, communication apps that can go on your iPad. And just have a talk to them about which one they feel would suit your child. And the other thing that we have to think about is that some people um, push communication apps on iPads, but some people put them on the iPhone or the iPod Touch. And just maybe talk to your speech and language therapist or your OT if your child has any access issues. Um, so we're looking at you know their vision and their fine motor skills. Um, and be able to choose the pictures when it's on a smaller screen. So we just think about those things as well. So next we're going to look at the dearer option, the more expensive option of the specialized computers um, that include voice output. So these aids are provided by the following companies in England and Ireland. So we have Safe Care Technologies and they're in Ireland. They deal with products from the Smartbox and Toby Dynabox range. And these include the Indy and Snap and Core um, software. And then we have Smartbox in England and they have the GridPad and the GridTree software. Liberator, they have uh, loads of devices. Some of them are Accent, um, ChatFusion and Nova Chat and they've developed software for all of their um, devices. And then Toby Donovox, we developed the Indy and the Snap and Core first, which is probably the newest on the market. Um, the Indy, in my experience, has excellent speakers. And so for classroom use, that's a very um, good tool to have because um, you'll know your child will be able to be heard when they use that device in a noisy environment. So again, you need to work with your speech and language therapist to decide which of these um, devices and products are best suited to your child and why. Um, and it really depends on your child and their skills and also um, the environment that they're in and why do they, what, where, when are they going to use it and where they're going to use it. Again, the speech and language therapist will um, be able to talk you through all the different ones. I've worked with all these companies and they're very easy to work with. They're very open, you know, to emails and telephone calls and conversations. And the English companies all have Irish reps um, and they're over in Ireland a lot. They run lots of courses and training. Um, yeah, they're very easy to work with. So if you decided that your child needed high tech device to support their communication and um, you would like to apply for a device through the HSC funding. Um, because you know, both options of you know, iPad or a dedicated device, um, they're both expensive. Um, and so a lot of people in my experience go through the HSC and the process of making an application for funding to them. So how, what do you do? What does it entail? So all steps will be carried out with your HSC speech language therapist. So first of all, they'll do some informal assessments um, with your child just to decide, well, what uh, device are they going to try? 
So an application for a trial needs to be made. So once you decide what devices you're going to trial on your child and what software you're going to trial, you need to go to the AAC suppliers that we just talked about and uh, apply for a loan. And then um, some suppliers do look for a loan payment from parents. It's usually, um, I think, less than 50 euros, um, just in case. It's kind of like their insurance in case of any breakages. So the trial will be run, will run um, optimally both at home and in school. Um, and so your speech and language therapist will need to give the dates to you, the parents, and to the school teachers. And you need to get vocabulary and pictures from your parents and from the school to uh, put on the device for activities to be run during the trial. And it's also a good idea for your speech and language therapist to check with the HSE manager uh, because some um, HSE departments, they will want you to have several points. So you might have to trial more than one device or more than one software. So the device trial itself, it's normally those companies will give you a device for two weeks. And you, the SLT will need some time to um, set up the device for the trial. And then your SLT should provide you with an A an AAC program for the trial period and meet with your parents and school to hand over the device and to show you how to carry out the activities. So at the end of the trial, um, you will feed back to your SLT and then your a parent needs to give consent, a written consent for the application of funding to happen. So an application to the HSE um, should include a letter of application, an SLT report, and quotes for the devices trials. Now, just a few questions um, that have come in that we'll run through next. So, uh, will using AAC affect my child's speech development? So, AAC does not stop someone learning to speak. And as I've already said earlier, research shows that it can help to improve speech. So, most of the research out there, or if not all, um, shows a positive impact of having AAC support on your child. So it has a positive impact on speech. So speech is usually quicker and easier than AAC. So people or children will always use speech when they can. All forms of communication should be encouraged, whatever works best at the time. So that would be applying your total communication approach. Okay, so the next question. How long does it take to learn to use an AAC system? So that really um, differs from person to person. So the answer here is how long is a piece of string? So the time needed to learn depends on the person and the system. So learning to operate an AAC system um, can sometimes be relatively straightforward, but it can take longer to learn how to use an AA system effectively in a conversation with other people. The learning to communicate with your communication aids is a bit like learning a foreign language. You need lots of teaching and lots of opportunities to practice. And in my experience, that's correct. And the um, companies who sell these devices, they run lots of seminars and training sessions. And they are, um, yeah, parents can attend and school staff can attend. So. That's one way of learning how to use your AA system you know, more effectively. Is it difficult to communicate with a person using AAC? So um, I think the rule of thumb is that you have to remember that you're having a conversation with the person and um, not with the AAC system, even though that's what's speaking to you. So just make sure that when you respond to a person who's using an AAC system, you talk back to them and make eye contact with them and not um, with the system that they're using. Um, another question that came in was how long does the whole press process of applying for a device take? So it is a long process. Um, so because you have to start off with, you know, choosing a device or several devices to trial. Uh, you may have to wait a couple of weeks for a device to come free um, from the supplier. Then you have to carry out, let's say, one or two device trials, so that's a month. Then your speech language therapist has to do her admin and write her report. Um, 
and then that is sent to the HSC manager um, in your area and they will um, approve that application and it goes to the disability um, uh, person um, in that area um, and then they will release funding and then at that time it's dependent on whether there's enough funding at that time so if there is it'll be quick enough from there but if there's a lack of funding you might have to wait a couple of months for maybe new funding to come in so i would think maybe um it can happen quite quick but it is still going to be a couple of months even quick so five or six months are quick and up to a year if it's slow um, Okay, um, they were all the questions that came in, um, and uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact myself, Lorraine, or Sinead, and our uh, email addresses are listed, and we will be more than happy to um, answer any of, any of your questions um, that come up. That would be great. Thank you.